So good morning. Um, so I asked Sandy, who's been sick, you know, what to talk about this morning. And she started doing the serenity prayer for me. And she said, and she said it two different ways. I only, I only caught one way that she said it. She said, may I accept the things the way they are. And what was the other way you said it? May I accept things as they are. May I accept things as they are. Yeah. Which is um, part of the serenity prayer. You know, to change things that you can change and accept the things that you can't change. And um, this, is, this is really the basic message of the Buddha, is to see things as they are. And um, we've done a couple mindfulness work, workshops here for uh, a couple different groups, one from St. Mary's Hospital, another from a nonprofit that wanted uh, to have some training in mindfulness, and mindfulness <coughs> is seeing things as they are. Now, if you have a piece of trash in the walkway, you can bid down and pick up the trash and everything's fine. And so you're seeing things as they are, but you also realize that you can do something about the way things are. If you have cancer, you can't bend down and pick up the cancer and throw it away. You simply have cancer, so you accept things as they are. Uh, not meaning that you decide to die early, it's just that you accept the fact that you're ill. And this is a great difficulty. I read something uh, by the Dalai Lama, who I read almost nothing by the Dalai Lama, but it happened to be in Reader's Digest this month. And so I got to read a little bit about the Dalai Lama, and he just recently turned 80. And he said, you know, there's different stages in life and getting old is just one of the normal stages of life. And when you're young, you can rejoice in all of the different activities you can do, and uh, you know your flexibility and your health. And when you get older, you can, you can enjoy the wisdom you've gained over the years. Um, and I mentioned cancer because uh, years ago, there was a, a doctor who made the statement which I've since heard many times, that if you live long enough, you'll get cancer of some kind. Not necessarily, he didn't say that if you live long enough, you'll die of cancer. He just said, if you live long enough, you'll get some form of cancer, perhaps one that's benign and that can be removed. If you live long enough, you'll get sick. I'm living proof of that, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I had many, many years of, of being basically bulletproof never having been in a hospital, never having really, other than going to get my yearly physical, you know, and then all of a sudden there I was in the hospital and, and we, it cascaded into a whole variety of things. And that's just part of living. It's just part of what is. And you, of course, you have a choice in how you do these things. And acceptance is a very important part of how you do these things. If you can accept the fact that you have limitations then you don't suffer because you can't do what you could do before. And I think men in particular have a great deal of difficulty with this, particularly if they've been physical and active. And as they get older, I don't know, I read a figure one time which I went, uh, how does that work? You know, past the age of 31 or 32 or 33, a man's physical strength starts diminishing by 3% a year. And that's one of those geometric progression things that my math, my math skills were always kind of weak. You know, I started going, okay, so 3%, and then you have to figure, there's a formula, but I don't know what it is, you know. You can do 3%, and that takes away of 100, so you've got 97% of your strength, and then 3% of 97% of your strength. And there's a way to set that up, but it, at some point you get to the point where you barely can get out of a chair. And actually it doesn't get that bad, but it, it would seem like it would. But uh, I noticed around here, I hit a point where I could only do about three hours of really physical labor. And I mean physical labor, I don't mean, you know, just light stuff. I mean going out and digging a hole to plant a tree or moving a stack of lumber or something like that. 
and I could only do about three hours of physical labor. Now I could do more, I could do four or five hours, and then the next day I was, I really was useless. And then if I really overdid it, two days after that I was pretty useless, you know. And, uh, and I just kind of accepted it as being, well, this is getting older, because it seemed like progressively this had taken place. So I accepted it, because there really wasn't anything I could do about it. And then I started falling down. And I went to my doctor for my yearly checkup, and I say, he says, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm doing pretty good, except I fall down all the time. And he said, well, that's not good. So then he sent me in to get a, an MRI. And that's when I found out how incredibly claustrophobic I was when this thing came in and surrounded my head. And, uh, and he said, well, everything's fine there. So I feel really good because at least back then I didn't have anything going on up there. But he couldn't figure out why I was falling down and I couldn't either and I didn't get hurt. I mean, I just fall down. It's not like I went, whoa, crunch, crunch and breaking bones in the hip and all that stuff. And then a little bit later, I went into the hospital that Sandy well knows and when I came out of the hospital, I couldn't breathe, and then I went back in a couple weeks later and got a pacemaker, and I stopped falling down. Geez, is there a cause and effect in here? Yeah, maybe a heart rate of 36 was a little bit of a problem. Yeah, that's what it was when they put the pacemaker in me. So, but I had kind of accepted I was falling down. You know, I did judo as a kid. I never got hurt when I fell down. I just rolled with it. But I thought, this is getting a little bit ridiculous. It's happening so often that I remember the last time it happened. So there is accepting what you can't change and there's, there's changing what uh, you can change. And uh, taking care of yourself is one of them. So uh, everybody's been regaled with the fact that I had a cardio, what did you call it, Steve? Cardi inversion? Oh. Uh, yeah, cardio, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> yeah, I can't remember where they restarted my heart to right rhythm. Cardioversion? What is it? Is that it? Cardioversion? Yeah, cardioversion. I, I, put some, I put something on it like cardio inversion because it was out of rhythm constantly and then they went, but nobody that's listening to this wants to hear this. But anyway, my, yeah, my heart wasn't doing too well. And then I went to the VA and they, they got it started up and beating the way it should. And now I can work, oh, five, six, seven hours a day. I'm really, really tired when I go to bed at night, but there's nothing wrong with being tired, is there, Sandy? Yeah, that's not a problem. What a, what's the problem is being tired and you haven't done anything, which is what I had for over a year, being tired and I really hadn't done anything. So, but I was sort of accepting it. I was sort of accepting the fact that I never could catch my breath even though Susan was going, you know, I think there's a problem here. And because Susan's really good at watching this stuff. So there are lots of things we just have to accept in the way they are. We get our income tax in the mail. You know, we have to fill all that stuff out and everything and we just have to accept it because there's not anything we can do about it. And they, when I turned 70, they sent me a thing and said I had to go retake the driving test. Not the driving test, but the written test for that. Probably in a couple of years, I'll have to go drive for them. And then, Sandy, you'll have to come and drive me because I'll probably fail the test. But this is, uh, this is the pathway to, to misery. The pathway to misery is not accepting what is. You know, and the path to happiness is accepting what is. And the Buddha said, he said it in a little bit different way. He said, we become unhappy because we desire things that we can't have. And we're attached to things that are going to change and we don't want them to change. And he puts the word desire back in and he says, um, you know, you can't, you can't stop this change. The only constant in the universe is that everything changes. I mean, we know that unless you have a funny view of what's going on in the universe, we know the universe is expanding. 
and they theorize, because what else can they do? They theorize at some point it'll start coming back in like a rubber band, but it never stays constant. Everything's in motion. You know, the reason why we have a pretty good proof that the Big Bang happened is because everything's moving away from the center. And astronomers go out and they look and they see that this is going over there and that's going over there and it's constantly moving so that we don't have anything that stays the same. Rocks don't stay the same. These mountains over here at one time were really mountains. Now they're just sort of like big hills, you know, and they're granite. And yet you walk around on the property and you realize there's some sand, but there's also a lot of granite that's decomposed. Makes good stuff to build road beds with because the decomposition of granite takes tens of thousands of years, but still it doesn't stay the same. Nothing stays the same. So we get old. And you guys all get sick because you don't go and get your, your <laughs> <laughs> pneumonia shot like I did. <laughs> So everybody in the temple got sick at one time or another. But that just happens. And so I had a very good friend who went to Japan for a year. We had a sister temple when I was living at the Japanese temple and he went there and uh, stayed with Bishop Fukunuma. And uh, one day he was sick, you know, he couldn't get out of bed. And this Japanese master went out and got him a Western style bed. And, and told him how important he was because he had this Western style bed to sleep in. And so he stood in the doorway every day for three days and laughed at him. And he came back and told that story and he didn't understand it. And, and it was just, you know, he was joining him in his, his experience of impermanence. Because impermanence take place with our health. And so he got whatever he had some kind of illness, maybe a cold, maybe the flu, but he didn't want to get out of bed. And so the master laughed at him. <clears throat> didn't feel sorry for him because it's just the way things are, right? Yeah, you get sick, you feel like crud, you take care of yourself, drink lots of liquids, go to bed, get enough sleep, and one day you get up and everything's okay, but you can't change it. We'd like to, just go to the drugstore and you'll see all the like to's. Just like when we get old, we can't change it. See my new picture? You haven't seen my new picture. You didn't see it, did you? When we go down for lunch, oh man, I got my new death picture. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a monk. Uh, for my 70th birthday, he missed it, so he had a professional photographer take this big, beautiful picture of me. I look like I'm hot stuff in that picture. Right, Eric? Eric's going, yeah, it's a good looking picture. The lady, when she did it, she says, okay, uh, you don't want that there, do you? So she took that out. And then she says, you don't want that over there. I got, a, you know, these moles that everybody has. So she said, I said, wait, oh, stop. If you take all of those things out of there, nobody will recognize me. So she took about half of them out. I had something on my lip. So she took it off of my lip. Oh, yeah, it's... You really can't do that with a real body, huh? Well, I, I, what was her name? Uh, Joan, uh, she just recently passed away. Comedian. Oh. Joan Rivers. Oh. Joan Rivers. She, she tried very hard to do it with a real body. I read something. Uh, in a magazine somewhere in the dentist office or something, and her daughter remarked on the fact that she'd had what I remember as 182 procedures in time. So, I mean, she probably died a little bit early because she kept messing with herself, but she was happy with the way she looked. I thought it was interesting that she, she had one facial expression when she finally passed away, which was just like that, right? Because everything was stretched so hard, but, um, you know, we, we uh, the Buddha said, uh, well, we have the story of the Buddha which says that he saw someone who was ill, he saw somebody who was old, and he saw somebody who had died. And he had not seen these things because he led an extremely sheltered life. And so he asked his charioteer, in other words, his chauffeur, what's going on here? And he says, everybody gets sick, everybody gets old, and everybody dies. And this was a real shock for him, and he was, uh, 
a young man when he saw this. And uh, it eventually bothered him so bad that he went out. And he also saw the misery that went along with it. You know, it's, you don't go to funerals, except for the Irish, you don't see funerals where everybody's happy, right? I think the Irish have a good approach. <coughs> they all get drunk. They sing a lot of songs. When they get really, really drunk, then they cry a lot. Because I think crying is important when you lose someone. And, you know, and then the next day they can kind of move on with what they're doing. But he saw the unhappiness that people had. You know, my friend was laying in bed and he was probably, he was a young man. Chip was, he was 19 or 20 when he was over there in Japan. He was probably really feeling sorry for himself laying in bed being sick. You know, there's probably more to the story when he said, you know, you know, and uh, Fukunuma Roshi, he came to the door and he laughed at me. You know, oh, poor baby, I thought. Life is really rough. You had the only bed in the house. Everybody else slept on the floor. So it must have been, must have been really hard, but you survived whatever it was he had. And we, most of us survive old age. They had to revise all the, the age charts now because we live so much longer. And I, and it, right? How, how long do women live now? I can't, I never can remember. They always live a couple of years more. It's about 80, 82, 84. 82, isn't it, for women? And guys are, are they 79 or 80? 80? I don't, I don't know. It's, it's right in there. You know, and when I was 50 years old, I got a letter from the Social Security Administration that said I should consider drawing Social Security at 62 because the average recipient of Social Security checks drew seven of those checks after they turned 65. That's, well, that was the average. That didn't mean my grandma lived to 96, but that was the average. Yeah, and so you think about it and you think, well, Social Security was never intended to be a 20-year retirement plan. It was just to help you a little bit, you know, in your last few years when you couldn't work. You know, people used to retire because they couldn't work anymore. They didn't retire because they were going to buy a, a Winnebago and go across the United States or, you know, buy a new home up in the mountains and go fishing. They retired because they couldn't work anymore. So, I remember that, and now we had to push that ahead. And I, I, I have to tell you, the way my mind works, I'm always amazed because, you know, we don't eat right. We don't exercise correctly. We do all kinds of things wrong in our society, and yet we're living longer and longer and longer. And there's lots of opinions about that. But this is about accepting the way things are. People that meditate, there's a part of their brain that they develop more better. And that part they develop more better is the part that says everything's okay. It's the part where peace is. And it's, I think it's the hippocampus, but don't hold me to that because it's been 50 years since a college biology class. So, but I was reading about that. So, you know, we develop it. And it, it doesn't have to be real hardcore Zen meditation. It can be simply you know, Vipassana, mindfulness, once in a while you do it. It can just be paying attention to what you're doing, which is what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is really not a meditation. Mindfulness is paying attention to what you're doing. And at the same time, realizing that your fantasy is not reality. And that's very hard for people. They, they want their fantasy to be reality. Their fantasy is that everything will stay the same. Right, Sandy? Nothing will ever change. You know, he'll love me forever. She'll love me forever. I'll have this job forever. This car will last forever. Nothing ever wears out. And yet the reality we know if we just look at things, if we just look around us, we realize things wear out. Our fence, our gate to the Zendo, Eric said to me, oh, look what's happening. And it was trying to fall down. It was leaning like this. And uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty drastic. And it was like, uh, Eric, maybe you shouldn't go around that while the wind's blowing. That's one of our typical really windy winter days. 
He said the wind was only 32 miles an hour. I think it was probably closer to 60, but he's got a little wind thing out there. And he said, no, it's only 30 miles an hour. But I had to get the tractor and push it up straight and get some bolts and drill some holes and redo it so it didn't fall down. It, it gets shorter and shorter. One time it did fall down. And then I had to cut it off and re-bolt it. If you go look at it, I bolted it twice. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, it'll, it'll be like the Japanese tea room. You know, in the Japanese tea room, the doorway to the Japanese tea room is or always lower than the shortest person that would go through the door. So that you had to bend down in humility to get into the tea room. So that'll be our gate to the Zento. It'll be about that high, and you'll have to low crawl through it. Yeah, or you can go around it. So, may you accept things as they are. That's a wonderful prayer for the universe, to accept things as they are. You know, um, but to change the things we can change. So I, I think that we ought to have the serenity prayer up here somewhere. You know, in pretty good type because it's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty good piece of uh, uh, liturgy. You know, so I'm looking at the clock. Can I accept things as they are? Well, this would be a short talk if I did. So, but I don't know what more to say about that. You yes, sir. Is, do you think that there's some sort of um, debate about something where? It is changeable, but people, some people perceive it not changeable. Oh, sure. So there's things you can work towards changing, but maybe it won't? Well, yeah. Of course, I don't know. Uh, Politics might be did that get picked up by your microphone? It's over there, so yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I, think, I think sometimes that there are, okay, how do I say this? Our latest catastrophe that we're involved in as human beings is climate change. And one of the arguments about climate change, and I, I had a great deal of difficulty accepting this, was the idea that we caused it. And, and there are people that really look at me like I'm a maniac because I said, I'm not sure that we cause climate change. Now, I did not say I'm not sure that there's climate change, okay? That's not what I said. I said, I'm not sure that we caused it. If we caused it, then from a scientific standpoint, it, it, there's a certain reasonableness to the idea that we could turn it around. In other words, if we actually understand the causes, okay, and one of the causes that they're, they're saying that happened was hairspray. Okay, we damaged the ozone layer, which we know has happened, right? Or we know there's problems with the ozone layer. I don't know that we've proven that we've actually done it, but all of this gets all real intricate. But all I said was, and then I got a lot of, oh, you know, what's the matter with you? You know, because we have, uh, politically, we have two groups. We have the conservatives, you know, and if you're not a conservative, you're a communist, as a friend of mine says. And we have the liberals. And of course, you want to feed everybody and give away everything and nobody has to work. The extre extreme liberal thing, that's what the Republicans think, okay? So, uh, since I listen to talk radio because it has the traffic news on it, I get to hear what the conservatives think. And they think that it's all a hoax, that climate change is all a hoax, and that there's no such thing as climate change. Reminds me of a gardening class that I took up here the first year we moved up here 36 years ago. And I took one over to BBC and I took a desert gardening class. And the instructor of the gardening class had a little commercial garden over in Apple Valley and he was talking about how to get things ready to grow. And he says, so, you know, if you have real clay soil, which they have in Apple Valley, they have a lot of adobe in their soil, he says, you need to mix in sand. Basic, basic garden. And the lady stuck up her hand and she said, where do you get sand? And he said, how about hang a bucket outside your door? You know, because, yeah, you've got sand all over the place. It's just you have to go to the right place to get it. So, 
this whole thing of there's no climate change, well, that, that means that nothing changes because that's, that's what the conservatives are saying. There is no climate change. Of course there's climate change. All you have to do is take a beginning geology class, which by the way, I was a geology major in college. All you gotta do is take a beginning geology class and the first thing you find out is that there has been constant change through the history of the earth. You know, there have been times when it's been very hot here and there's been times when it's very cold here and there's been times when the whole earth was covered with water and, uh, you know, we have beaches in the, in, uh, in the Andes, you know, we have beaches over there in the Himalayas where the uplift is taking place and we have this constant change taking place and then we have someone that comes along and says, no, there is no such thing as climate change. And I always like to use an example for people that say that because I don't want to argue about it because I'm not a scientist and they're not a scientist, but I go, you know, in Lucerne Valley 110 years ago, they dry farmed. That means they went out and they took the seeds and they threw them on the ground and it rained enough that the seeds grew. And after a while, they couldn't, they didn't have enough rain to dry farm. So then they ran cattle out here because there was enough food naturally growing for cattle to eat. And then it got even drier and this is, you know, record. We, we only have weather records for about 110, 120 years old. Before that, that somebody wrote in their diary, it rained today. So we had cattle, because there's two ver very poorly written books on the history of Lucerne Valley, and I have both of them. And uh, I use them to go to sleep at night. I just start reading them and off I go because they're so poorly written. And so then they, they ran cattle here until there wasn't enough forage for them to eat. And then they took them up against the mountain over there where all that green stuff is and the con you know, they're doing cement and all that. And they had them there and then they took them finally up to the top of the mountain over in the Sugarloaf area on the, you know, by Big Bear and all of that stuff. And there's cattle up there today. I've seen them. I went driving down a road and saw all kinds of cattle in between the trees. That's where they took the cattle. Because, and then what happened? Well, then they started growing alfalfa because the soil's good, but there was no water. So what did they do? They pump water out of the ground. And the way they grew alfalfa was they either flooded it, which farmers tell me is the best way to do it, twice a year, or they overhead watered. Okay, that's climate change. I really don't care what the, the, the uh, you know, super Republicans say, that's climate cl change, at least for this area right here. So maybe the rest of the word, world stays constant and we live in this funny third dimension or fourth dimension or 16th dimension or something where we've experienced climate change. The Sahara Desert's getting bigger. Does anybody deny it? <coughs> the Sahara Desert's getting bigger. So why would we think that there wouldn't be change? 50 years ago when I was in college, they told us we were at the end of an ice age. And how do we know we're at the end of an ice age? Because we still had glaciers. By definition, an ice age exists when you have glaciers. When all the glaciers are gone, the ice age is over with. That's just the way they defined it. So now we have glaciers disappearing. About three, four years ago, National Geographic had a big issue that was dedicated to talking about all the glaciers that are disappearing from the national parks in the United States and the world. Did we cause it? I don't know. Can we change it? I don't know. Is it worth trying? Why not? If there's something we can do that maybe can turn it around, why not? What's the worst case scenario? It doesn't work. And so, why is that a problem? You know, they're talking about limiting greenhouse gases. Is that going to change the quality of your life? Yeah, it's going to cost you more for groceries. Yeah, and you're probably going to have to buy an electric car at some point. Is that the end of the world? No. You know, I laugh at people that talk about organic farming. Why would you want to farm any other way? You don't need to buy a magazine to know that you don't want to put poison all over your food before you eat it, right? Isn't that kind of commonsensical? 
and yet a lot of the food we eat has poison sprayed all over it. So, because we don't think we can change something doesn't mean we shouldn't try. But the Buddha would say, you only get into trouble if you get unhappy because you didn't change it. That's all. Okay? It's always okay to try to make things better. Just don't make your ha happiness hang on the idea of being better. Because then you're in trouble. So.